Resource Watch is brought to you in association with Tebe Investment Corporation. Diamonds are more sparkly than ever, with the prices for natural rough diamonds expected to rise by up to 10% this year. Riding the crest of the wave is a miner which just last week announced it had sold a rare blue diamond stone for almost $28 million. We are chatting to Petra Diamonds this week on Resource Watch. Hello and welcome. I'm Nozi Pumbanjo. Here's a roundup of news making headlines in the resource sector. South Africa's government made it clear it intends to go ahead with the procurement of 9,600 megawatts of nuclear power. This after signing a cooperation agreement with Russian state-owned nuclear company Rosatom. This will see South Africa building large-scale nuclear power plants with Russian reactors. BHP Billiton is considering a secondary listing in London for its shares in its planned new company after some requests from UK-based investors. In August, BHP said it would spin off some aluminium, coal, manganese, nickel and silver assets worth an estimated $16 billion into a new company that would be based and listed in Australia, with a secondary listing in South Africa. Fuel storage and distribution facilities in Cape Town Harbour will get a 650 million rand investment boost over the next two years. This will see the expansion of the Bergen Cape Terminal. The investment is a joint venture between Dutch-based storage group VTTI, Tebe Investment Corporation and Jakaro. Petra Diamonds is a leading independent diamond mining group and an increasingly important supplier of rough diamonds to the international market. We're speaking to the CEO, Johan Dippener from London. Johan, thank you for making the time to join us. We've just seen your preliminary results, very solid numbers, revenue up by 20%. Maybe let's get a snapshot of the market right now and in particular prospects for demand. Yeah, Nuzipu, it was another year of very strong results delivered by the company and uh, the uh, very compelling supply and demand fundamentals uh, for the uh, supply and demand uh, of diamonds is very favorable. So we uh, expect uh, these conditions to uh, keep on existing for the foreseeable future and uh, it bodes very well for our expansion plans to grow our current production from 3 million carats to 5 million carats by 2019. Of course, there has been uh, some concern that uh, supply might not be able to meet the appetite that we're seeing from uh, the traditional demanders of diamonds. Do you see, foresee your production targets perhaps maybe filling that gap and maybe keeping the price of diamonds within range? Uh, yeah, the additional 2 million carats uh, that we will be upping our production by should be seen in the context of uh, around 125 to 130 million carats per year production. So uh, wouldn't be as bold to say that the growth in our production would uh, very much change the supply and demand uh, dynamics. But there's across the world, there's um, <coughs> small expansion uh, um, uh, projects are mm. on the go in northern Canada and so forth and uh, I think uh, that um, for the time being supply and demand uh, works uh, well uh, for now uh, but maybe three to five years out without any new discoveries we, we will mm. see a severely constrained supply side. And of course, Johan, you have indicated that you have quite uh, sound uh, production targets that you've set. Maybe talk to us about your operational pipeline and uh, how exactly you're hoping to meet that target. Uh, yes, uh, we have uh, two uh, major projects in South Africa, the Cullinan mine and the Finch mine, where most of this growth will be delivered from. So uh, across our portfolio of mines, We've been spending around 2 billion uh, rands per annum on the capital expansion uh, program. Two more years of this uh, type of spend will see uh, um, us being assured of delivering uh, that growth plan. Um, so uh, the programs are going very well, so we, we, we are very much on target to deliver that growth plan. 
Mm, and uh, just zooming in into your South African operations, uh, looking at your results, we can see that you're seeing some cost pressures uh, in the South African space. Maybe just talk to us about what some of these cost pressures are and what's your game plan going forward to make sure that you keep these two within range? Uh, yes, uh, you know, as everybody knows who operates in South Africa, labor costs and uh, electricity costs are our main concerns. Uh, we, uh, we would very much uh, like to see the whole country and politicians alike uh, pulling together so that we can manage these uh, costs much better. For our own company, uh, these expansion programs will see us uh, being able to up our volumes, combating uh, those uh, cost pressures as well as a certain level of uh, mechanization and uh, automation that we'll see as we deliver these new um, projects. Mm. Johan, uh, turning to the broader picture in South Africa, and in particular the regulatory environment, we've got a new minister in the portfolio of, uh, of uh, mines uh, in particular. How do you find the operating environment now? There have been some concern that there's a certain degree of uncertainty. Is that playing out in your boardrooms and the discussions that you're having with your team? Yeah, of course, as any uh, person in business will tell you, uh, investors uh, do not like uh, unpleasant surprises. So we all uh, appeal to the uh, government to keep regulatory framework uh, predictable and consistent. Uh, recent discussions that we've had at the chamber with the minister and other role players, uh, it, we certainly feel that there's a, a much more positive mood and a willingness now to work together so that we can overcome these uh, problems that we've seen in the platinum industry uh, and that we don't repeat that across the whole uh, South African mining industry. Mm. And of course, you have had uh, the fortunate experience of, of concluding a multi-year wage agreement with uh, the National Union of Mine Workers. How have you had to rethink how you engage uh, the unions as one of your key stakeholders to ensure that you keep any disruptions to a minimum? Yeah, uh, you know, although these discussions with unions are uh, most of the time they're quite difficult uh, discussions to be had uh, because of the historical um, or how the mining history has uh, yeah. played out, uh, there's uh, some a level of distrust between labor and uh, management. In our own case, we feel that we've made great strides in concluding the, this three-year agreement uh, starting to look at measures how workers can feel that they are aligned with our shareholders um, and uh, we feel that uh, that uh, we have achieved some degree of that we all have to be uh, keep on working uh, extremely hard so that we can build that necessary trust but uh, I uh, must tell you as uh, we've concluded this agreement I'm very positive and optimistic that we'll see a period of stability now and that it will bode well for our own delivery of our expansion programs and our production buildup. And of course, uh, to some exciting news, of course, we've seen uh, the recent discovery of uh, some red diamonds and in particular uh, that blue diamond that was found. Maybe just give us an, a little bit of insight into how the diamond moves from uh, being found to reflecting on your books. What kind of process uh, does it have to go through? Yeah, we, we uh, have concluded a number of weeks of evaluating the stone. Uh, we uh, invited the major players in uh, the space of these special uh, colored stones. Um, they have all examined the stones, uh, submitted uh, bids to us. We, we evaluated those bids and decided, uh, as you would have seen in the press, to accept a bid uh, worth uh, nearly $28 million, in which we retain a 15% stake in the stone. So I think that reflects our own belief that the ultimate polished stone, now the stone will go through a process of, of uh, further evaluation and actual polishing. We um, believe that this process will yield further upside for the stone as we will see 15% of those revenues when the stone is finally sold. Mm. And uh, maybe just looking quickly to that uh, cooperation agreement that you've signed uh, with uh, Manica in Botswana. What are your prospects uh, for that uh, partnership? Well, how are you hoping this is going to play out in terms of uh, production targets and for one, but also revenue streams? Yeah, uh, traditional uh, exploration methods has always been uh, very uh, uh, people and cost intensive people on the ground. Uh, 
uh, chipping away, drilling and so forth. And uh, this cooperation agreement with Manika, they've got some of the best mines, mines in the industry when it comes to diamond exploration. So our portfolio of licenses in Botswana together with theirs, uh, we will be using that expertise to more cost effectively uh, uh, hopefully find ourselves uh, discovering uh, an economic uh, uh, kimberlite in South Africa. We have put in a number of prospecting um, permits and we hope to have those soon um, so that we can build on this uh, expertise that we now have within the company. And finally, Johan, just before I let you go, uh, understanding that you are seeing greater demand uh, from the likes of the U.S. and China, your traditional partners, but is there uh, appetite from emerging markets and other developing economies uh, wanting more diamonds? Yeah, certainly. I think China has been the one story that's been told over and over over the last five to ten years. But we certainly foresee uh, many other emerging economies like uh, India, Turkey, Brazil, Russia. All these countries uh, will become uh, more and more important um, uh, as uh, many more uh, middle class households are, are added to those economies. And uh, who can blame them? They are all looking to own a diamond. It's such a special uh, uh, thing to own. And uh, so we foresee very strong demand in the years to come. A bright future for diamonds. That's a very big thank you to the CEO of Petra Diamonds, Johan Dippenau. Now, a fridge magnet is often a cute ornament used to post reminders or simply serve as a decoration. Most of us have them, but do you know what it's actually made of or why these small magnets can hold so much weight? A magnet is a piece of iron which has its component atoms ordered so that it gives off an external magnetic field. Modern Magnetics is a commercial and industrial magnetics company that supply to a variety of businesses such as the Fridge Magnet Factory. Basically we order a roll of magnetic material. For Fridge Magnets we use a uh, 0.6 millimeter. Um, the roll weighs in excess of about 30 kilograms. I think I showed you a little bit earlier, a quarter roll was left and it's still got quite a lot of weight on it. Um, all our design work is done on Coral Draw. From there it's exported to a RIP program which will rip, uh, basically print, uh, manages the print, sorry. Um, print directly onto the material on small quantities. Uh, the, material, the machine will cut it directly afterwards as well. Um, larger quantities, we'll uh, print a lighter print onto adhesive paper that is then laminated and then sent out to our die cutting factory. From there, they're basically packaged and shipped. Producing more than thousands of customized magnets a day, one can see how attractive this metal really is. This week's show, do stay in touch following me at Nuzi Pumbandra or at CNBC Africa. And don't forget that our show's hashtag is Resource Watch. Until next time, from me and the team, it's goodbye for now.